yeah, what I, what I want to talk about is causal hypotheses in medicine. Uh, and things like uh, cigarette smoking causes cancer, uh, certain drugs cause relief from uh, pain or amelioration of symptoms or cures or whatever. Uh, and trying to think about what those causal claims amount to uh, and how they can be tested e e experimentally. I think the first thing to notice is that they're funny sort of causal claims in that they're not deterministic. Let me just explain what, what, what that means. It, it, let's think about Newton's second law of motion, which says uh, the total force acting on any, any, any body is equal to the mass of that body multiplied by its, uh, by its acceleration. Best read, although Newton didn't write it this way, is acceleration equals force, div totals force acting on the body divided by m. Uh, that's completely deterministic. If any body of a given mass has got a certain f total force acting on it, then it's bound to have the acceleration that's dictated by that, by that principle. So it's one, e one, in one input in and a definite output out. These causal hypotheses like, lung, like smoking causes lung cancer are not like that because we all know lots of people who smoke two, three packs of cigarettes a day and don't die of lung cancer. Uh, although they're very likely, if they live long enough at any rate, to have some smoking-related disease. But it's not deterministic. It's, not, it, it's stochastic rather than fully deterministic. And, and these sorts of hypotheses are all over the place. If you're driving down the motorway in England, you get signs saying tiredness kills. Explain, you could elaborate on that as tiredness causes accidents that may be fatal. Uh, and again, nobody says that every tired driver is going to be involved in an accident. It, it's... it's Something to do, obviously, with increased probability. That's really, they're stochastic causal hypotheses. That you have a bigger chance of getting uh, lung cancer if you smoke than if you don't smoke. So they're probabilistic or stochastic causal hypotheses. But the, causal, the probabilistic element can't exhaust what they, what they say. And for two, at least two very reasons that I'll at least try and make clear. One thing is that the uh, relationship the, between the probabilities, between the raising and lowering of probabilities, is, is symmetric. That is, if, if the probability that you, uh, that, that you get lung cancer given that you smoke is higher than the probability of getting lung cancer if you don't smoke, then it must be true, just by the probability calculus, that the probability if you pick someone out who's got lung cancer that they have smoked is higher than the probability that they didn't smoke. So, the, the relationship is symmetric. It's intuitive when you, th I mean, you can easily prove it from the probability calculus, but it's intuitive. You say, if you take a random person who smokes, you're saying when you say uh, smoking causes lung cancer, that that person has a higher probability than a random person who you picked who didn't smoke. But if you've got now looking at the other way, if you've got the, uh, if you've got a person who's got lung cancer, the probability is much higher that they will have smoked. So you've got this two-way thing. But causal hypotheses are not two-way. They're only one way. Um, it's the smoking that causes the lung cancer, not, not the lung cancer that causes the smoking. It, it indicates that somebody's likely to have smoked, but it, that's, not, that's not a causal connection. So that's one reason why it can't just be a question of raised probability. The, o the other is a famous problem that you get immediately in, in first... Uh, one, first or second lecture in statistics, though it's very often forgotten, and it, it's the fact that um, there's a difference between correlation and causation. So standard examples are, you know, the cock, or cro the, the cock crowing is constantly correlated by, with, with the dawn. Whenever the cock crows, the dawn comes soon afterwards. But of course, there's not, that's not causing. It's not the, co the, the, the cock crow doesn't cause it. The two events are correlated but they aren't causally connected. Or take another example that I like to use. Um, dying tomorrow, uh, if you're taken into hospital today, is much more likely than, uh, that, than that you'll die tomorrow is much more likely if you were taken into hospital today than if you weren't. But you wouldn't say, I mean, there's obviously things like superbugs, where it may be that there's an actual ca causal connection. But on the whole, uh, that, that there isn't, it's not that going into hospital is what made it much more likely that you would die. It's, it, the, the two events are related as what called common 
uh, effects of an underlying cause. It's, you were taking it off because you were very ill, and it was because you were very ill that you died the next day. So there's, there's uh, an important thing in, 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 to recognise that, that uh, in order to establish causation, it's not enough to establish that, uh, that you've got uh, increased probability. So it's not enough to establish that smoking causes lung cancer uh, to establish that the probability that you'll, you'll smoke, um, that the probability you get lung cancer if you smoke is higher than the probability if you don't smoke. Okay, so what is going on? And uh, I, So there's more to causation, and, and it means that we have to think about, well, it gives us the rationale for thinking about controlled experiments, which are very much the norm in, in medicine. So let's take another standard example. It wouldn't be any good to, um, it wouldn't be a very good test of the theory that giving people uh, vitamin C, regular doses of vitamin C, uh, cause, causes relief from colds if you gave a whole bunch of people uh, who were suffering from colds uh, vitamin C for a week, and they all, even if they all recovered, because you, you know from natural history that um, co uh, colds do generally clear up within a week in any event. So you've got a contrast, you, and you need the contrast in order, to in order to establish causation. You would need to look at another group, uh, uh, th those who weren't given uh, the vitamin C, and to see whether the rates of recovery were different in the, in the two groups. So and that's standardly what you do in medicine. When you're testing some new th therapy in medicine, you don't just give it to people and see, give it to a bunch of people and see, who are suffering from some condition and see what, what happens. You also involve another group uh, who are not given the treatment. Now, it's not good enough just to have a, a, a natural history group in general or even to just have a control group. You've got to think about the properties of the control group relative to, uh, to the people who are in the so-called experimental group, that is, who have been given the new therapy. So, let's say, for example, that you, you're testing the theory about vitamin C and colds, uh, and you've got a control group who are not given vitamin C, uh, and let's say there are more people who recover in the vitamin C group than in the non-vitamin C group, but that doesn't establish causation because there might be other differences in the people in the control group. So they might be younger than the ones that are in the experimental group. They may have less well-established colds or less severe colds. Uh, they may uh, be fitter in general. Uh, so you, wanna, you want to control deliberately for these different factors that, uh, that may also have a role uh, so that it's only when you get a, a, an improved performance in the experimental group, the ones who've been given the experimental therapy, compared to that heavily uh, worked on control group, that you can say that it is it, it, that you've got evidence that the therapy caused any uh, improvement that you that you that, 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 that you observed, and really what you're doing there is to control for that problem you know that that I mentioned before, or to de deal with the problem about you know, the cock crowing or the people being admitted to hospital. Uh, you're trying to make sure that there's no underlying common cause, but that's not enough. Even if you've got you know, the same age profile, the same fitness profile, the same degree of severity of the, of the, of the uh, colds in the two groups, that still doesn't establish that it, if there was an improvement in the experimental group that it was caused by the vitamin C, because it may well be, and this is the basis of uh, randomised tests, that there's some other, you can't control for every conceivable other variable that might have an effect. There might, there's, You've got the problem with what Donald Rumsfeld used to refer to as the unknown unknowns. There might be some. There might always be some other factor, and so the way that uh, at the way that uh, people try and deal with that is by randomising. That is making it uh, in effect you're tossing a coin. You've got a whole bunch of people, and you decide what, who goes into the experimental group and who goes into the control group in effect by tossing a coin or by using uh, r random number generators. Uh, and that's supposed to then make sure that at least probabilistically 
the two, uh, the, the two uh, groups, the experimental and the control group, uh, are similar for all factors, both factors that you know might have an, uh, an impact on whether you recover from your cold or not, and those that you don't. Now, there's lots of discussion as to whether this is a, a, a genuine rationale. It's a very interesting area of current research. Um, the other thing that I should mention about these, con about these contr controls is, uh, groups is that they're also invariably placebo controlled. So what, why, why should they be, why should they be placebo controlled? What does it mean? Well, first, placebo of course means something, it's from the Latin for I please, it's a, a, an inert substance that however looks identical to the, it, let's say it's a, a straightforward case, it's a pharmaceutical trial. There's the pos even if the two groups that you're looking at, your experimental control group, are the same in all pre-trial factors, just the very fact that, that, that one, if, if you just did a natural history group, so you just left the, ex the control group untreated and just see what, how they manage with their colds, uh, it might be that although there's not no efficacy in the vitamin C, for the, that just being given a treatment by a doctor an authority figure, that might itself make people expect to get better and it's very well established that expectations of relief do in fact produce relief, uh, at least in, in respect of certain conditions. So you control by making it impo impossible as far as you can for the people to tell which group they're in. So you pr create a placebo, that is a treatment that doesn't in fact, you know doesn't have any effect, so it might be a sugar pill or a bread pill or but it looks the same, it's got the same red coating, it's, uh, it's given at the same time. And this is again, to, it's because of the, the, the nature of causal hypotheses. You want to try and find out whether it was the vitamin C that did it, so to speak, that, and exclusive of the vitamin C. You want all other factors to be, to be uh, controlled for. Uh, because basically what you're look, looking to test is, what, okay, somebody did, re you gave them vitamin C and they did recover, but did they recover because of the vitamin C? That is, would they not have recovered had they not been given it? And that controlled trial is an attempt to answer that question as systematically as we can.